So, uh, um, the objective of this talk is to uh, get, uh, get to, uh, a good general understanding of Elasticsearch and what it is as a, as a search engine, and uh, also using it as, uh, as an OSQL data store as well. So, a little bit about me. My name is Craig Brown. Um, I'm uh, been a search architect and been working on producing big data, and uh, I'm currently doing uh, some consulting uh, at the moment. And uh, can, you know, I have a blog there and, and uh, a Twitter account there if you guys are interested at in all. Um, so Elasticsearch. So who, who knows, who's familiar with Elasticsearch at all? Okay. About how, roughly. Um, so Elasticsearch is a search engine um, that's based on what we see in core, very similar to solar. So who's familiar with solar? In the room here, okay, a lot of people. So that's that's not surprising. Solar has a much bigger, um, it's been around quite a bit longer, has a much bigger uh, following than Elasticsearch has. So it was essentially written by this guy named Shai Bannon. He's he wrote about you know almost 100 percent of the first few releases. Uh, he's since formed a, 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 a company now and, and has some people hired on. Uh, there's a lot more community involvement than there used to be. Um, Elasticsearch.org is the site we can find out about. Elasticsearch.com is kind of the corporate site now. Uh, the latest release, .90.3, is built on a Lucene 4.3 core, if you guys are familiar with, uh, with Lucene and all the kind of the underlying engine for it. And uh, it's really built around JSON over HTTP. That's sort of the core, you know, one of the core features of it. So. Um, as I'm going through this stuff, I mean, I think we've got some varying levels of, uh, of uh, knowledge or experience. You guys are welcome to, to ask questions. I can be pretty flexible with the, with the uh, presentation if you guys want to spend a lot of time answering questions or go off into you know, asking questions. I'll answer questions. Um, you know, feel, free to, feel free to pop up and uh, see what we can do. Um, so Elasticsearch, I don't know if you guys know a lot about Solar, uh, Solar essentially was built as sort of a single node, uh, kind of a, a search engine, and uh, it, they added uh, a Zookeeper kind of as a way to scale the product, which is a which is a great way to do it. Elasticsearch was built kind of out of the box as a scalable search solution. So the, you know, some of the underlying architecture there is a, a little bit different. Um, has support for multicast, unicast, and special uh, AWS scaling mode that makes it really easy to, to set up and, and scale clusters. Uh, a lot of people are using AWS these days, so that could be kind of a real advantage. Uh, it's open source with an Apache 2 license. Um, uses HTTP as a, as a main transport. We can also use Memcached and Thrift. And then it also supports a, an internal scripting, in, internal scripting abilities. Um, to be able to do different things like uh, documents, updates, and it's used a lot for custom scoring. Um, so if you want to kind of implement your own scoring algorithm, then this is one of the ways that you can kind of accomplish that. Uh, so a little bit about what it looks like. So from a kernel or you know an HTTP perspective, it's really easy to jump in. Uh, Elasticsearch is Java-based, like Solar and some of the others. Um, but uh, it's, it's kind of object oriented on JSON, so the interface is a bit different if you're familiar with Solar. Um, so these are an example of uh, three different documents that we can index. Uh, we don't have to define any kind of a schema. We can just, you know, we could just shove this into Elasticsearch and say, look, this is my document, I want you to do something intelligent for me, right? And most of the time it's pretty good at it. Um, um, so once we have data in the system, we want to be able to try to search it, right? Sorry, go ahead. So, sorry, you're saying this is schema free. So uh, in contrast to solar, you don't have to define any of the fields you want. Yeah, it's, it's solar from what I understand is more field based. You get just sort of a list of, of fields that you end up putting in. And if you have some kind of an object structure, you have to, you know, basically flatten it out manually. Right. 
Um, Elasticsearch does something similar with the fields because they have they're both using leucine under the covers, right? But it does it for you, <laughs> which makes it a lot nicer. So you can put structured or more structured documents into uh, Elasticsearch, and it will, uh, you know, start right. When you so with it doing it for you, you can also define how like the the field is indexed and stuff like that. So you yes. can say I want to use n-grams instead of you know token instead of just general uh, space, but you know white space. Yes, exactly. Um, I don't have any examples of building a schema in this presentation. Okay. Um, but you know this kind of more of the intro thing. But yeah, absolutely. So you can so where Solar uses XML to define all that stuff. Elasticsearch does it all in the JSON document, and you can have a, a settings and a mapping document for any of your indexes. It's kind of interesting in that you can actually define um, rules for mapping. Um, so, for example, one of the one of the uh, uh, one of the gentlemen over here was talking about doing log log searching, log analysis with Elasticsearch, which is very popular. So, one of the things that you could do is you could define, or uh, one of the ways that it's commonly set up is that you gather your documents by day. So for each day, it's a new index. But you can give Elasticsearch rules that will say, you know, look, if the index sort of has this name, I want you to apply this kind of a schema. And it will do it for you automatically. You don't have to manually, mm -hmm. you know, or programmatically set up, you know, okay, here's my new index that's created. Okay, now I'm going to put my data in. It could do a lot of that stuff for you, which is really nice. And then one last thing on this one, I see put. Generally, put means you can do that as many times as you want, right? And it's mm -hmm. time potent. Is that what that follows? So does it? Yes. Yes. So it won't create a new name. It won't create a new document for Shane, for uh, Shai. If okay. you do that ten times, or will it create a new one? Yeah. So let me let me uh, describe the, this just a little bit more. So localhost ninety two hundred. So Twitter is the name of an index, and tweet is the name of a type. So each index can have its own type, and they can be searched differently or independently um, based upon how you form your queries. Uh, in this first example, you'll notice that the type is actually user. So we're going to put two different types in the same index. And it will kind of manage that for you. And I'll show you a short demo to show you how some of this stuff works. Uh, so kimchi actually is the ID of the document. Okay. And the second one, the ID is number two, and then the third one here, the ID is number three. Okay. Um, you don't have to supply an ID, and uh, Elasticsearch will supply its own. And actually, it, it will, it, it has kind of its own other ID that it uses internally to help manage documents. Um, so and that's more of a doc, right? Doc itself, the doc ID. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so um, this is all, you know, if you guys are familiar with uh, a lot of the NoSQL terminology, this is. You know, when you think of this a bit as a document-based um, uh, da document uh, database right? with full search and full text search engine capabilities, right? <laughs> Which is really nice. Go so, ahead. is there a standard NoSQL database running on the main? Yes. Or is it, it's just built in from SQL? Yeah. Well, this is the search engine that indexes everything. Mm -hmm. But is there a NoSQL database that's hooked into it? Um, open source, or it's just its own. Sure. So the question is: Is everything based on Lucene, or is there something else underneath? It's all Lucene. Okay. It's nothing else underneath. So it, there's some good things about that. There's some drawbacks about it. Okay. So, for example, Lucene does not handle binary data really well. So if you want a document store to do binary data, this is going to help you. Um, does it use like a character encoding by default, or is it does it support UTF-8? Uh, UTF-8 by default, but um, you know the Lucene Core and, and by extension Elasticsearch and Solar support you know a, a wide variety of, of languages and language types and, and uh, all the standard Lucene analyzers, filters, all of that stuff that you can apply. You can set it up in the, in the mappings to do all that kind of stuff. Um, okay. Um, so that's you know this is a little bit of the structure of the document, how this is put together. And the nice thing is you can do this in in any in any language, even though you know it's it's very specific. Um, so a little bit about some of the, the search query. Um, so in, in the top we're we're looking, you know, it's basically um, the field is user and the query is kimchi. 
in this case. Uh, the second one is uh, it's the same query, it's just a little bit in a different format. It's JSON's format versus the, the HTTP format here. And then the third one shows an example of um, doing a range query on the post date and then giving it dates that Elasticsearch can, can do the range query between. Um, just a couple, sort of a, just a quick, kind of a quick example. Um, so um, this is an example of putting in a document in here. We're doing uh, an HTTP GET. Uh, Twitter, again, is the index. Tweet is the type. And uh, the ID is 2 in this case. So we'll pull that document back for you directly. So basic gets and puts. And then just a, just a little bit about schema mapping. This is just a really, um, the first one, if you just do a put to that index, it will create a schema, but it's just, it's, or create an index, but it's just an empty schema for you. The second one is just a very, uh, very small example. You know, we're expecting a, a type of name, which is going to be a string value. There's a bunch of other parameters that you can add, uh, you know, to specify, uh, you know, analysis, or analyzers for search and for querying and, and a bunch of things like that. Um, you can get really quite complex schemas if you need to. Uh, and even if you have a defined schema uh, for an index or type, um, by default, Elasticsearch will um, uh, continue to, to modify your schema. You know, let's say if I packed in a, in a document that had a user and some other fields, Elasticsearch will accept that and they will modify your mapping for you by default. You can tell it, uh, you know, you could disable that feature if you want to kind of tighten your mapping down uh, for you, or tighten your mapping down. And in that case, if you try to index a, a document with extra fields, Elasticsearch will throw an error to say, you know, look, you, you put some stuff in here that I'm not expecting. Um, so kind of a, a neat thing that you can do with this, I don't know how many are familiar, but you can sort of, uh, with a, this kind of a setup, you can sort of upgrade your schema on the fly, right? So if, if we started like this and, and all of a sudden we have a requirement to add new fields uh, to our schema, which never happens, except all the time, um, then you have to, you can either add new fields to the schema and update it or just throw the document in Elasticsearch and it will, it will pull it in and start creating all those new fields. And then as your, as your application updates the previous documents, it will continue, you know, it will continue to work. So you can have sort of an in-fly, you know, on the fly updating of your schema. Um, so it's multi-tenancy as well, out of, out of the, um, uh, off the bat, which we talked a little bit about, you can specify uh, multiple indexes, you can specify multiple types for indexes. Uh, so it can be very flexible in how uh, you know, you index your data, how you, and how you can then use that in your search queries to find, you know, what you're looking for. Um, so just a, kind of a, a note on this as well, I was talking uh, with a guy this last summer about, he was having a little bit of problem understanding Elasticsearch because he would form queries and it would give him back things that he didn't expect. It's like, well, what do you? <laughs> it's like, it's like, it's not, a, it's not like a database. If I do a query for the database and it doesn't have anything, it won't give me anything back. But Elasticsearch will. I said, right. It's a search engine. <laughs> it's based on, you know, it, you got to think differently. It's based on finding things. It's based on findability. And so it, it's a, it can be. You can make it very exact if you wanted to, but it can be very inexact, which can be a very good thing. I mean, if you have a, you know, a corporate search engine and somebody's looking for something and they type in a query and nothing comes back, the user's gonna leave the site because you just told the user, I don't have anything interesting for you, <laughs> right? You said go away, you just said go away. Uh, of course, that's kind of a, a double-edged sword. If you give back the user something that's completely irrelevant, they're gonna think, you know, your site is dumb, you're not doing anything. You're, you're still on topic, go ahead. Can you, I see here you're doing a query via get. Is there a way to do it? Um, with post. Yeah, with a post with a, with a payload in the, in the body so you, you don't have to worry about the limit on the get, you know, on HTTP get? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, and so if we're going to get to that, I don't want you to rush ahead. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, no, this is this is going back a little bit. You can see the top is again in this. Well, it says it says get there. Oh, because it's pulling back. Uh, but it, it does it does post as well. This again in this case. And I think it's not. Am I right or wrong that that solar doesn't support that? Solar's get only for, for queries. Um, I believe so because uh, I believe uh, solar uses URL parameters. Yeah. To form your queries, and so it ends up being, um, generally speaking, probably a lot less flexible, especially if you have a complex schema. Yeah. And so, and and also with the JSON, you know, it's a lot more readable. <laughs> uh, you can you can format it do, and uh, make that stuff. Um, Elasticsearch also will have support for parent-child documents. Um, so it's a it's a. You know, un underneath it does some tricks to make it work because it still ends up getting flattened out. But it ends up uh, giving you some very interesting possibilities that I think you can replicate on solar, but it becomes a little bit more difficult. The interface here is quite a bit easier. So for example, like if you wanted to, wanted to do a query and pass it on all the children, right? Yeah. You could do that actually quite easily. So, um, so a little bit about uh, a little bit about the architecture of uh, Elasticsearch. It's distributed by nature. Um, I'll show you a little little demo here. Um, so it breaks all the data into shards. So in each shard is a is a fully complete Lucene index. If you, if you guys understand anything about Lucene, so it exists on its own. Um, and uh, when you create an index, you specify the number of shards, which is you know how it's going to distribute break up your data. Um, and generally the more shards, and as you add more machines, the shards get spread over machines, it can increase your, your write scalability. Replicas are copies, you know, one replica is one copy of, of all of your shard set. So by default Elasticsearch, if you don't if you don't specify it will create an index with five shards and one replica. And it will not put all the replicas on the same machine as you know, essentially you call it the master set of shards. So if you specify, you know, one replica, which means my master copy of the data plus one copy of the data, you'll only get one set of shards until you add a second machine. Then what it will do is it will put one copy of all your data on one machine, and it will put the second copy on the second machine. So you have two identical copies. And the nice thing is that it's it's not a master-slave environment, so any, any node can answer any query. And if it doesn't have the data, it will proxy the query across the other nodes um, for you. It can be quite nice. So, um, so if you, you know, specify a schema with you know, five shards and no replicas, and you add a second machine, you'll end up getting three shards on one machine and two shards on the other machine. And then it will, I have a little, a little uh, Video that, that uh, kind of shows kind of shows how it works, um, and then you know the underlying Lucene engine, um, each uh, uh, shard or Lucene index is broken into segments, which are kind of extensions. So uh, essentially, if you're doing a lot of really heavy indexing, a uh, heavy indexing, um, once the shard gets too big, it has to com it has to compact it because you you only specify a limited amount. Uh, but what it does is to keep the write performance up is it will create additional segments until it gets to a limit that you tell it, say like 30 segments. And then once it gets to 30 segments, it'll have a compaction phase, so your indexing will slow down while it's doing the compaction, and then it'll keep you know, doing this, this kind of effect. Um, it also has routing ability, which is a way to tell Elasticsearch that you only want to look at specific shards in your data, okay? So for example, if I have five shards and I do a query, um, all the queries are scatter gathered. So it will query all five shards, it will get the results and merge them and give them back to you. Um, and it works really well. If you have a lot of data and you have a lot of shards, <laughs> it takes a lot longer to be able to do that. So what you can do is you can uh, give Elasticsearch essentially a hint when you're indexing your data and when you're reading your data to say, you know, based on, on this piece of information, this is where I want you to end up putting my data um, or, you know, putting it in the index. And so, for example, 
Uh, the nice thing about it is instead of, you know, if you've got 100 shards, you can get it so the Elasticsearch will only search that one shard that you're certain that that data is on and give that information back to you, which is fantastically faster. Um, the only drawback is you have to make sure that you get your routing value right. If you're doing routing and you find out that you're not getting the documents back that you think you should, it's probably because the data, because your document is actually on a different shard than what you ended up specifying. And even though it's in your, it's in the engine, it can't find it because of how you, how you did your routing. Um, so to, uh, so this is a little um, uh, video that, that Shai put together. This is a little bit old. Instead, instead of uh, uh, instead of calling a replica, it calls it a, a backup, um, uh, a backup shard. But you know, I'll I'll kind of pause this in a couple places, but it'll give you a little bit of a you know, little little better indication than just me talking. So there's a client and node. It's a simple put. So in this case, it's going to create um, it's going to create an index with two shards, and the, the P is for primary. So it calls it master of primary. So no, you know, we didn't give it any kind of scheme. We didn't say anything. We just said, like, here's a, here's a document. I want you to put it in in, uh, in here. So so what happens if we add another node? Well, since we specified a replica, this is where you get the primaries on one node and you get the replicas on another. So if we go ahead and add another node. So one of those shards from the replica gets moved over and then if we add a fourth node. So we've got each primary shard is on one node and then you know node being a, a separate machine or a separate instance of Elasticsearch. And replica is being on two other nodes. Now if we do a query here, um, well, this is a put first. So we do a put, we put a document. It's going to go, so these are numbered one and, you know, it's one P and one B on the left. So that's one shard and it's replica. And this is another shard and it's replica number two. So it's going to put the document, you know, it's going to index the document on the primary. The primary is going to send the document over to the replica to make sure it gets indexed. And so it does a complete, it does a complete write before it comes back. Now if we do a get, the get can uh, happen from either of the, that number two shard, either from the primary or from the replica. Either one can answer and it's, it's just as valid. If we do a search, in this case it shows the scatter gather. It's going to hit either Either it'll hit both shards, either the replica or the primary. Sorry, either the, uh, the yeah, sorry, that's it. It'll hit either the primary or one of the replicas to be able to answer. Oops, stop. Um, to be able to answer that query, so that's that's pretty straightforward. Are you going to cover more on the shards? And then kept, like I noticed, you have to define them front. What if your data gets bigger? <coughs> So shards um, have to be specified up front. Uh, replicas can be specified on the fly. And so that's one of the, the challenges you can run into is how many, you know, how many shards do I specify? If you do run into a situation where you didn't specify enough shards up front, what you end up, generally what you end up doing is um, if, you, if you do it on a, you can either create a new cluster um, that has the settings that you want and copy the data from one cluster to the other. Or you can specify a new index with the settings that you want and do it on the same cluster. But you end up having to copy the data from one into the other. And if you've got a lot of data, that's, that's a bit of a drawback. But that's, you know, um, that's one of, one, of the, one of the things you have to sort of deal with here. Can you rename an index once mm -hmm. it's, like let's say you have like search and then you decide to create search one with the new number of partitions that you want, can you then rename search one to search? Um, you can in a way. Um, uh, Elasticsearch supports aliases for um, indexes. And so the, the neat thing is that you could, you could put multiple indexes uh, under the same alias. So I was talking about the uh, uh, searching for uh, logs. 
So if you have, so like I said, a lot of companies will set up this rolling structure where like say you keep uh, seven indexes, one for each day. And when your new, new day rolls around, you create a new index for the new day and you roll the eighth one off now. But what you do is you, you put all of those indexes into one alias. And so your application doesn't have to change, it doesn't have to worry about it. Elasticsearch rolls that underneath for you and it does the right thing, so it's very cool. <coughs> so that's the way that you would end up doing that. Um, so there's always there's always fun things like that you can do. <laughs> um, so some of the more you know database or data oriented things about it is that Elasticsearch is always read consistent, right? So um, if you're familiar with with other uh, NoSQL databases, um, React, uh, MongoDB, other ones like that, there it tends to be you can have uh, latency in your in 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 how the data gets updated across replicas, right? And so it's possible to query a replica that's out of date and get data that's out of date. Um, it's the nature of, of having distributed data. Once you distrib once you distribute your data, something's going to get out of date, right? So the advantage there is that you can do the reads really quickly. You just have to be careful that your data may be out of date. And depending on your application, that may be perfectly fine. Right? If someone gets a notice of a tweet two or three seconds later, it's okay. The world's not going to end. <laughs> you know, being a notification of you know nuclear fallout, that could be you know something a little bit different, perhaps. But um, so the way Elasticsearch is designed, um, all gets are always are, are always um, consistent, and it has a real-time get uh, ability as well. So you can post and immediately do a real-time get and actually get the most up-to-date version of that information back, which is very cool. Um, is there a, so I noticed that you're differentiating, is bullet one and two differentiating in that you can get the document back right after you put it in, but, you, but it might not come back in the search results if you search for a keyword after maybe up to a second. Exactly, you're right. Okay. That's, that's an important distinction. So gets and searches are different, right? Mm -hmm. So in Elastic, sorry, in Lucene, um, it, it basically has a commit structure. So if you, you index a bunch of data, Lucene will pull it in really quickly for you and write, and write it out, but you actually have to perform a, a commit um, before you can, before those documents become searchable, right? With the real-time get, uh, essentially, uh, Lucene can get the document either that are indexed and committed or uncommitted, which can be really handy if you're using this more in a database scenario. Um, but you have to do the commit, and the commit is fairly intensive. Uh, Elasticsearch actually does the commits for you automatically, uh, and you can set, you know, you can set essentially a delay here. By default, it's one second. So if you index a document. Uh, by default, one second later, it will be there. You can force Elasticsearch to do, to do a refresh. So, for example, if you're writing unit tests and you index a document, you don't want to put it away for a second to try and get it to show up. So you can force Elasticsearch to do um, to do uh, refreshes, which is it's different than how how um, uh, the underlying solar the underlying Lucene commit happens, but. Um, and the writes are actually tunable, which is kind of kind of nice as well. Again, if you're looking at it more from a database perspective, so you can, you know, you can do uh, set and forget it kind of thing, where you're just saying, I want to acknowledge one. You know, you might have five replicas. You can say, look, I just want one replica. I just want one acknowledgement on the primary, and then you can write the rest of the replicas later. I don't care. Um, you can do quorum, which is a majority of of. Uh, of uh, replicas. So, for example, if you if you have your primary plus four, it's going to be five copies of the data. On quorum, it'll write three copies, and then it will return to you and uh, write the other two copies in the background. Of course, you can do all, which you know says give me a full commit, come back after it's all set, and then we can move forward. Uh, of course, the, the advantage of the of the all is that obviously you get a lot, you get really good consistency. Um, obviously, it's slower. So it depends on, you know, if you're doing high speed indexing, you probably want to, you know, if your data can stand it, just go up to, uh, to two to one, and uh, you're good. So, question with that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you were talking about, you know, if you had to 
change your indexes or you know grow your shards or whatever, you would be copying bits from one cluster to another. So is the two so you say it's tunable, can you change that after the fact? So that like I'm doing a bunch of writes and I know that I'm just copying over to a new cluster. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to use one for now and then I want quorum later. Yeah. So it's tunable per write. Okay. So you can yeah, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And so that's where that kind of so the the question was essentially, you know, is is when you set up the index, are you committing what your write strategy is? And no, it's per it's per write, so you can change it on the fly, which is which is good. Um, so, uh, uh, Elasticsearch, um, one of the, the points that's a little more difficult is doing backups. It doesn't really have a, a backup facility, you know, like a MySQL or an Oracle or an MS SQL or something like that has. Uh, what it has is what's called a gateway, which allows it, uh, you can specify a way that it can um, uh, basically make a, a replica of its data structures outside of the machine or outside of its normal storage mechanisms so that if the node goes down hard and you know some of the data on disk becomes corrupted that the node can recover itself. Um, the nice thing about it is since it is distributed anyway and if you have at least a good replica remaining if, if the node goes down hard let's say the machine dies power supply goes out you can just pull that machine out put a new machine in and it will get the copy, you know, it will copy the data from the other nodes that have good replicas of that already. But having a gateway here can be, uh, can be really quite helpful in the strategy. Uh, it also has a concept of a river, um, which is a, basically a type of connector. It's a way to get data into Elasticsearch, right? Um, so it has kind of a, a Twitter river that's fun. I have a project that I use that in, and the nice thing is it's it's uh, kind of built in, you can do a couple of configurations, so I mean literally in five minutes you can spin up Elasticsearch node and configure the Twitter river and it'll start collecting tweets for you. <laughs> and obviously you can start searching them. Um, sir? What's the performance like uh, using RabbitMQ? Have you played with that? Uh, so the question is what, the, what is the performance using RabbitMQ? Um, I don't know, I haven't used it, but I know that there's quite a few people that are using um, uh, connectors for, you know, rivers for it. I'm thinking in terms of a distributed queue, if I want to feed data into that queue and then connect and last search into it, will it just slurp them in at real, on, at real time or? Yeah, so the, the rivers in Elasticsearch are a single thing on the cluster. And if the river fails for some reason, the cluster will spin up a new copy of that. And, and uh, I think essentially it's a, it's a full operation. Um, so a lot of uh, uh, a lot of these uh, uh, you know other data um, uh, storage mechanisms, RabbitMQ and stuff, have a way to query like the most recent data that's come out of it, and so it essentially takes advantage of that. Um, I don't have it on here, but there's also a a um, basically an SQL um, river as well, so you can. Because uh, the, the interesting thing here, um, take a note, um, so a lot of times you have your data but you want to do more things with it than your current storage structure will let you do, right? Um, and so, but the challenge is now I have to start dividing up my data and problems start multiplying, right? Um, so, you know, if I've got my data in an SQL database or I've got a bunch of stuff coming in RabbitMQ, RabbitMQ is awesome for what it does, but if you want to search it, you can. And so, you know, things like Solar and Elasticsearch become very key in these kind of things if you want to be able to do more interesting things with your data. Um, in, in certainly the NoSQL space, there is uh, a trend that essentially is trying to combine the two things. Uh, it's not a, I don't know anybody that's trying to combine it. Uh, RabbitMQ, but in general, if you look at React, you look at MongoDB, you look at CouchDB, you look at Cassandra, they're they're going towards the direction of trying to have more features that we've seen Elasticsearch and Solar have, so that you can keep all your data in one place <laughs> and do the things you want to instead of having 
a bunch of data over here, then I've got to shift it over to the search engine so I can do search engine work with it. And of course, Elasticsearch and Solar are going the other direction. <laughs> they have all the search capabilities. They're trying to become more of a general purpose database or data storage engine um, to kind of help, uh, help alleviate some of that. But have you ever written a, are the, you know how uh, complicated it might be to write your own river? Have you ever tried that? Um, so the question is about writing your own river. I have not. I've looked at the code for the Twitter river and it's, I think it's a single class or with a couple of imports. It's actually really quite easy to do. Have you heard of one for Kafka? I haven't for Kafka. Um, but the, Dynamo? Uh, Dynamo probably. Um, I mean, this this is a thing that the, the community is growing. It's getting bigger all the time. And so, you know, and, and there's a, a lot more people that are contributing rivers and all these other kind of things for it. Um, Logstash is, is one that's, that's really quite popular as well, pulling the logs into Elasticsearch and kind of, you know, doing that rolling structure that I was talking about. Um, so, uh, Solar, Elasticsearch, normally, you know, those are the ones that get compared to the most similar. Um, solar, uh, now, uh, up until, you know, the last year, year or two, um, Solar is now part of Lucene and part of the Lucene release structure where it was sort of a separate project before. So Solar will always be more up to date on the latest Lucene releases than Elasticsearch will be, just sort of by nature. And that may or may not be important depending on how cutting edge you guys are with things. It uh, definitely has a larger community. It's been a lot around, around a lot longer. It's been used a lot more. has a larger tool set uh, as well. Uh, feature set, you know, uh, tends to be you know more in line, obviously, with Lucene. And if you if you like XML, that's a positive for you. <laughs> if you don't like XML, then that's not a positive for you. But. Is there a so one of the things I found positive with Solar is, is that it's well documented how you can write plugins. Right. And a plugin is like a for those the, you, it sounds like you already know, but just you know it allows you to do stuff with the results. That's one one yeah. example. So you're, you're right, and that's, you know, there's there's some pros and cons both there. Solar has definitely some advantages in how certain plugins are written for Solar. Uh, Lucene, or sorry, Elasticsearch has, it's actually very pluggable as well, but not, not as many people have used it. It's not as well documented. You're right, that's probably something I should have on the slides, you know, document. Well, I didn't know I was actually asking. No, I, I, I know wasn't alluding to anything. Yeah, I know you weren't trying to correct me. I'm okay. just self-correcting here and saying, yeah, actually, that's that's a good point. But uh, yeah, you're right. I mean, Elastic Search is more of a frontier. Um, uh, so uh, just for the record, I wasn't saying that. I was, I was, I'm really wanting to know. We're currently deciding between the two. Oh, is that okay? Yeah, yeah. No, that's fine. I wasn't wasn't taking it out. Okay. okay. It's like, come on, I thought you were hacking me. Come on, let's go. Let's get some, <laughs> let's get some stuff going here. Yeah. Uh, uh, Um, so Elasticsearch, uh, it's natively distributed, uh, which can be a real advantage. Um, JSON-based, which again, depending on where you live, it can be an advantage or a disadvantage. Uh, certainly the way the queries can be uh, documented in uh, JSON is, uh, makes it much more readable over doing query strings. Um, the dynam it's very dynamic, the template-based uh, schema or defined schema. As a matter of fact, you can partially define a schema and partially define a template. Elasticsearch will fill in the template part for you. It's really nice. Um, Elasticsearch will actually also return the source document that you indexed by the file, which is another, uh, I believe in Solar you have to specify the, the um, uh, fields that you want to get back. By default, Elasticsearch will give you the entire document back unless you, tell it you, want, you don't want to and you just want to get specific fields back. And you know, also by the way, I'm not trying to make this Elasticsearch versus Solar, Elasticsearch better, kind of a, a deal either. It's just they're they're very you know similar technologies, and so um, uh, so the the committing thing. There actually is a mock Solar interface, so if you're very if you're more familiar with that, then but it's it's just for the HTTP interface. It's not for the XML configuration. Um, but you know, if you've got an investment in the Solar interface. 
it eases the transition over to using solar. Um, and uh, of course, the use of rivers as well. Can you so describe it natively? Is that, are you just saying like RPMs and stuff are available? You don't need to like a Tomcat container to run it? Or what, what do you mean natively distributed? Um, so natively distributed meaning that um, Elasticsearch doesn't need anything external to scale. Like Zookeeper? Yeah, like Zookeeper. Okay. But there is a Zookeeper module if you like Zookeeper. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, so that's, uh, by natively I mean it's built in. Okay. It's built in, does it? Um, does so, it still require a container, just like just like solar? No, it doesn't. So even that, does it run on Jetty or, or Netty or? Um, it uses a Netty, I okay. believe, as an interface, but it's built into the product. It's right. not external. So we're on times three thirty. So this goes twenty five more minutes. Is that right? Goes till three fifty five. Uh, so yeah, so let's let's take a look a little bit. Oh, that's just good. Yeah, okay, so we got plenty of minutes, so this will be good. Um, so I wanted to show you guys a little bit about what some of this looks like. We can go through pretty quick. And this will answer some stuff. So so I have, uh, can you guys read that okay? Does that look good, good mm -hmm. for you? Okay. Uh, so I'm this demo I've been using a little bit older release. This is .19. Um, there's a .20 release and a .90 release, and they're working on a dot, uh, one dot .x release. So uh, it, the the uh, numbering is kind of funny. They were doing, you know, I mean we're technologists. We, we something's got to get at least to a one dot over version before we can trust it, right? <laughs> it's like a dot what? <laughs> no, that's obviously way too old. Um, and so a few few projects have run into this problem where they get up to a point and then they start redumbering everything to make it look better. React, if you guys are familiar with that, they have the same problem. So they're they're up on one dot release and stuff. Um, so I have just a little I have a bunch of scripts set up here. So I have a, uh, one here. So this is essentially how you start Elasticsearch. You just you just uh, uh, you, um, the bin Elasticsearch is a is a script. It's a it's a Java. Uh, application dash, dash f will start it up on the command line so that you can see what it's doing. So if I just if I just do this, so this will come up and it'll tell me some information about what it's doing. Um, so it says mass master or mass mastered. Actually, that's the name of the node. So Elasticsearch is a little bit funny in that all the nodes have a name. You can pick one or it will pick one. <laughs> And it has some interesting names. So, uh, uh, for example, I've had Satan come up on my cluster one time. Uh, I've had Sauron come up on my cluster. <laughs> it's like, no wonder it's not working right. Sauron and, and, and Satan are on the cluster. So, obviously, I'm having trouble here. So, Isn't it uh, Marvel Universe characters? Something like that? I, it's, it's got a wide variety. Yeah. I don't know quite where they get it from. But I think it's my frequently on Satan. <laughs> yeah, so some of it's uh, kind of funny to see to see what they do and pick and come up with. Um, so we'll so I've got a second window here. I'm in the, in the same place, so I'm going to do that again. So here's a second node starting up. It's on the same machine, and so its name is Carter uh, Gazaganian, Gazaganian, I guess whatever something. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit fine. So if you notice up here, uh, it says Mass Master added Carter, uh, what's his face? Um, so Mass Master is in this case the master node, uh, and it's not it's not a true master slave kind of a situation. All nodes are equal, but it, it does have a master node that, that, that helps to coordinate some things with it. And of course, if Mass Master goes online offline, we bring it back up. And yeah. He'll, he'll connect to the other node as, as the node. Um, you know, so down here we say this node started. So we just started a two-node cluster. We're kind of uh, we're kind of in shape there. Let's pull us back over a little bit. Um, may not go through quite all of these, but. Um, so these are some scripts that I have set up to do some things. So this should look familiar. These are the, the documents that we, we saw a little bit earlier. 
Um, so again, if you look at the first document, the index is Twitter, and uh, the type actually is user. It's a little, di little different type, but you can put documents of different type in the same index and search them uh, uh, by specifying the, the index. If you want to specify the type, now you can narrow the type down, and uh, you, can, you can search multiple indexes and multiple types at the same time, depending on what information that you're, that you're interested in. So now if we execute this, So you see over here on the right that it, it you know, gave us some more information about, uh, so it has a, so you can see it says shards uh, five, one, so it's shard, five shards, one replica, uh, and then, so it gives a type, uh, it gives a type user, says dynamic, type tweet, says dynamic, so it gives you a little bit of information about what it, what it, what it did in there. And then when it comes back over here, it says this OK true, and it says it three times because we did three different documents. So okay, oh, the OK true is Elasticsearch's way of saying it worked. Congratulations. Um, and uh, it gives you back the IDs here. This underscore ID is, the, is what it's using. So you now if we you know, look at a, an example of a get here. So we ask it to get that, that document back. and. Obviously, gave it to us, no big deal. Um, look at the next one. So, this is a search. So, this is uh, the query is user kimchi. And if we look at our, our documents up here, we can see that all three of them have a user of kimchi. So, we expect if we execute this, that we should get all three documents back. Mm -hmm. And we got a shard failure. there. That's it. So the demo gods are not liking me very much at the moment. So if we do, I swear it worked earlier. So let's see it. Oh, okay, I don't know. Here, I can up. Uh, is that right? Well, I kind of noticed that you had the same IP address the 2.15 on the top window and on the bottom. I don't see any other IP addresses. Yeah, so this is 9200. If you'll notice. So it's the same instance, but it's running to a war. Yeah, it's running. So Elasticsearch by default uses ranges 9200 to 9299 for rest, restful access. 9300 to 9399 has its communications port. Normally, when you do this, <laughs> probably since I was playing around earlier, uh, your first node will come up on 9200 and 9300. Your second node will come up on 9201 and 9301. Mine came up on 90, 9302 and 9202. <laughs> so that's why we're not getting that. So, so the idea, part of the idea here was to show that I can kill this thing. I can kill the master node and then go ahead and do my search query and get back all the documents that I want, right? So we expect we get all three documents back, and we did. Well, this one's supposed to be shut down. There we go. Now it's, now it's dead. Try that again. So we still get all three of our documents, right? That's what we, that's what we want to do. So we'll pull this back up, and down here we should see that it, that it connects. So it says it received a join node. This guy's name is Damien Margo now. Don't know who that is. <laughs> Margo Damien. Damien. <laughs> He's related to same. Apparently. <laughs> Apparently he is. Uh, so this one came back up on 90, on port 9200. Is there anything to call like dot pretty? I'm sorry? Can you do something called dot pretty and curly braces where it will just give like a ta tabulator format or something? Um, I'm having a hard time hearing. Is there is there a pretty form of that command that'll format it nicely to show. Oh, it. yes, yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, it doesn't have it here. Um, 
Yeah, so in this one, if you if you see where it says pretty equals true, okay. so that's where we get. So if we execute this one, it gives you something that looks a little bit better. Yeah. Okay. Good question, though. Thanks. So uh, yeah, so that's one. I guess that's one drawback of JSON. If it gets all mashed together, it doesn't look very good. <laughs> um, so I've got about ten minutes. You can yeah. specify the, the name, and you also specify the port as you're starting up here. Yeah, you can. You can. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but this is sort of the default behavior. But there's an Elasticsearch config, and so you can tell it. Um, uh, you can tell the ports to listen oh, so on. Right on the file when it starts up, it reads that. And it starts yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's see. So it uses a YAML file, if you guys are familiar with YAML. Yeah, so you can specify um, uh, node.rack has to do with um, uh, physical locality of nodes. So it's not nearly as advanced as something like Hadoop, if you're familiar with that. But you can give uh, nodes certain, a certain affinity for each other. So for example, you can put all of your primaries in one rack and all of your replicas in another rack and tell, tell Elasticsearch that information, and then by default, it will favor the nodes that are physically closest to it when it's doing, you know, doing searches and indexing. So it can give you, you know, if you get into large clusters, it can do that. So uh, each cluster has a name as well. Um, and uh, so I can run two different nodes on one machine with a different cluster name, and they won't connect together. You say, I see you. <laughs> You're the wrong cluster of lock it together, right? Uh, so you could you could use this. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things you could tell nodes if they if you want them to be master, if you don't want them to be master. Uh, you can also tell a node if you want it to hold data or not. Um, so a node that doesn't have data um, is essentially acts as a routing node or you know a proxy node. As a matter of fact, if you're doing um, <coughs> Uh, if you're doing Java development with Elasticsearch, you can actually have uh, your Java application connect as an Elasticsearch node in the cluster, which is nice because now your application has all of the same routing information as any other node that's in the cluster, and so you can get better um, you get better performance out of that way. If you're doing the the, the REST interface uh, and you have a large number of nodes, and most times it's a two hop process where You'll connect to one node, and that node won't have your information and won't be able to complete the search. It will have to connect to another node to complete that, and so you get you get the two hops. Uh, so that's that could be an important thing if you're doing really high performance so stuff. Is there an API for that Java interface thing too? Yeah, there's a very nice there's a very nice Java API for doing all this stuff. Okay. Um, you could you could specify that you know there's a lot of stuff that you can do and specify ports that it connects to, ports that it publishes. Uh, which could be a, important in a cloud environment. So you can have your nodes connect on an internal IP to broadcast an external IP uh, that connect to uh, recovery processes. Um, uh, this is some of the some of the uh, the ways that you can configure it to connect. Uh, Unicast. You can just give it a list of IP addresses and hosts, and it will try to connect. It doesn't have to connect to every node. It just has to be able to connect to the master node. From the master, it can find all other nodes. So essentially, you only have to put the master node in the list, and it will do it will do the right thing. So, is there something around number of ins uh, one instance per core, or does it just try to use all the cores that are on the on the box it's running on? Uh, so, good question. So, it's basically the question is about having to do scalability in cores. Um, you could put one Elasticsearch process on a machine with many cores, and it will do a really good job. Okay. Uh, Elasticsearch by itself, especially if you get into the Java API, is very distributed. Uh, so when you do uh, when you do uh, a call from the Java API, you, know, it, so, um, you can specify that you want it to return the results immediately, or you can specify um, you can basically get an object back that you can use to wait for the results to come back. Another kind of fun thing is you can actually um, 
Um, it, it has a multi-query ability, so you can actually pass in multiple queries at the same time, and it will, you know, it will do all the searches and give you back the results, give you back a set of, of, of search results that you can then part, uh, which could be more efficient than just sending them in one by one. Um, so as far as uh, you know, a little bit of getting a little bit more on the big data side, the Hadoop integration. So Hadoop acts as a, as a gateway storage mechanism. Um, there are load funk and, and store funk uh, uh, that are written out there if you guys are using uh, PIP for MapReduce. Um, so you can use Elasticsearch either as a gateway to pull data into your MapReduce process or as an output to, to put stuff into it, right? Um, of course, you have the Hadoop streaming inter interface where you can manually export data from Elasticsearch put it into your Hadoop cluster, do your processing, and then whatever you want to do it from there. So a little bit more of Elasticsearch and big data is, you know, how, how is it interesting in, in, in a big data environment? Um, so one of the things is very good as an endpoint for process data. So MapReduce is great, Hadoop is great. Um, once you process the data, you've got to do something with it. <laughs> it's great if you can process it sitting on disk, it doesn't do anything, anybody, anybody any good. But it becomes a very good way to pre-process data and throw it into the search engine so that you can do faceting or searching or other kinds of results that you want to get out of it. Um, so you can use so uh, you know an aggregator for, for business intelligence or dashboard information. Uh, again, especially with, with rotating indexes, uh, you can build really flexible dashboards that give you you know, up-to-date information on hourly, daily, weekly, whatever, however you want to be able to aggregate the information. Um, the third one about using, so if you guys, have you guys ever done anything with collaborative filtering, uh, which is using machine learning, it basically says, okay, I'm gonna, I have a set of, of data, and I'm going to compare every set in the data, or every item in the data, with every other piece of, of data in that set. And I'm going to compare how close they are to each other. Um, which is a great thing. It's how we basically say, you know, okay, this item looks like this item, so if user A bought this item, you know, we're going to suggest the, the second one because they may be interested. Um, once you get past, you know, probably millions of data points, that's, it's, it can be an intractable problem, right? So what happens if you want to perform collaborative filtering on a hundred billion or a billion data points? Uh, it becomes very difficult to do. So one of the techniques that you can use that we used in, in the company that I work for is we actually loaded 400 million data points into Elasticsearch and then we formed a query that says, okay, give me the ones that look like this, right? So Elasticsearch reduced the set from you know, hundreds of millions of comparisons down to a handful. And then there was a, a, a more, uh, um, uh, the, the, other you know, the, the other algorithm basically took that and uh, you know, did some refinements and, you know, on that reduced set of information. And then, of course, as a data storage engine in its own right, Elasticsearch works, uh, works really well about that. So, um, looks like i got to get out. We've we we got about a minute left. Um, so, just real quick, Elasticsearch is actually a project, an open source project that I started working on that basically takes and puts uh, a more database-oriented query front-end uh, in front of Elasticsearch to make it more accessible to sort of the general database or you know, the general development population. Elasticsearch is great, but the API is search. If you don't understand search, it looks very foreign. Um, some resources, and then our, of course, uh, our lovely uh, uh, companies up there that are sponsoring us that we appreciate. Um, don't have any ton of questions, but I'll go next door in the master room uh, if you got into the experts room, if you guys have some more questions or want to talk about some more stuff. Um, okay. Thanks. Appreciate it.